this is going to be pretty shocking for some of you. There is a dividing line in the book of Romans. This changes our understanding of the golden chain of redemption and who the elect are. Romans is actually a letter of reconciliation between the Jew and the Gentile believers. And those whom he called, these he also justified. Those whom he justified, these he also glorified. The Roman church at this time transitioned from predominantly a Jewish church, now mainly to a Gentile church, after the expulsion of the Jews. You can not break this chain as Paul writes it. Greetings and welcome back. This is session eight of our two-part Roman study. Hopefully you have had the time to view all sessions prior as they build upon one another. Our topic for this session answers the question, how does the finding of two-part Romans align with Paul's other writings? Why is this so important? It's so important because all scripture is the inspiration of one author. Our God is not a God of confusion. Which doctrine is more important than the salvation of man? Confusion and controversy among believers has reigned for hundreds of years about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of salvation of man. This doctrine is referred to as soteriology. As we have studied, the Apostle Paul made it clear in Romans that he revealed the mystery of the gospel for the first time. Yet many today say that Romans present a mystery beyond the finite minds of men. Did Paul advocate that he concealed a mystery about the gospel? Not at all. Paul advocated to the contrary. Yes, the gravity of our interpretation of Romans is major. This issue is not a secondary or tertiary issue. The gravity of this study is about the gospel itself. As we concluded our last session in session seven, remember that I kept a score of the points of evidence affirming the two-part Romans as truth. The weight of this evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt. I really do appreciate all of the comments. Most of them have been very supportive, but it is interesting that some discount all the evidence as silly. But why? <laughs> One reason may be that upholding the truth that Paul wrote first to the Jews in the first eight chapters of Romans and then to the Gentiles in the later eight chapters of Romans is so contrary to the teaching of some people. Per our evidence presented thus far, look at seven distinctions that Paul made in the book of Romans. I arranged these in an acrostic that might be helpful for you as a memory tool. Our evidence has documented, number one, chosen, Paul defined as the remnant of Israel. Number two, adopted, Paul defined as the remnant of Israel. Number three, predestined, Paul defined as the remnant of Israel. Number four, beloved, Paul also defined as the remnant of Israel. Number five, elect, Paul also defined as the remnant of Israel. Number six, saints, Paul defined as the remnant of Israel. And number seven, the mystery of the gospel revealed. Paul declared he revealed the mystery of the gospel. It is for all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So capacity to be saved, mystery of the gospel revealed. This brings us to the question of the ages. Do all people have the capacity to be saved? Do you have the capacity to be saved? Is there any chance for you to be saved? If you do not have the capacity or the chance to be saved, is that not 
Contrary to the gospel being good news, that's terrible news. You or someone else will never have the chance to be saved? You see, many claim that decision was made before a person was even born. Does that sound like the God you know? It is recorded that even Jonathan Edwards at one time referred to that interpretation of some having no chance as a horrible doctrine. Jonathan Edwards, as a college student, regarded the election of some to salvation and of others to eternal damnation as a horrible doctrine. This excerpt is from Biography, Edwards Center, Yale University. Marzen, 2003, page 51. Quote, the years 1720 to 1726 are partially recorded in the diary of Jonathan Edwards and in the resolutions for his own conduct, which he drew up at this time. He had long been an eager seeker after salvation and was not fully satisfied as to his own conversion until an experience in his last year in college when he lost his feeling that the election of some to salvation and of others to eternal damnation was quote, a horrible doctrine, end quote, and reckoned it exceedingly pleasant, bright, and sweet, end quote. Also, listen to how John Piper admitted he first struggled with the idea that man has no choice. One day, I met James Morgan in the hall, who was confronting me with these texts that were making me very angry and making me cry in the afternoon as I read my Bible. And I pulled my pen out of my pocket. And I stood in front of him, and after a few minutes of heated discussion, I held my pen in front of his face, and I dropped it on the floor. And with far less respect than a 22-year-old ought to have for a teacher, I said, I dropped it. I dropped it. As though that would settle the issue. That there were no divine authority or power that might have somehow governed my dropping it. Emotions run very high when your world is collapsing. By the end of the semester, it was in ruins. And I wrote in my blue book, I can picture the place in the class where I was sitting. Romans 9 is like a tiger going about devouring free willers like me. Allow me to also read how R.C. Sproul described his struggle about how many will not have a chance to be saved. I am reading from an article that Dr. Sproul published in December 2012. Quote, my struggle with predestination began early in my Christian life. I knew a professor of philosophy in college who was a convinced Calvinist. He set forth the so-called reformed view of predestination. I did not like it. I did not like it at all. I fought against it tooth and nail all the way through college. I graduated from college unpersuaded of the Reformed or Calvinistic view of predestination, only to go to a seminary that included on its staff the king of Calvinists, John H. Gershner. Gershner is to predestination what Einstein is to physics or what Arnold Palmer is to golf. I would rather have challenged Einstein on relativity or entered into match play with Palmer than to take on Gershner. But fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I challenged Gershner in the classroom time after time, making a total pest of myself. I resisted for well over a year. My final surrender came in stages, painful stages. Why do you suppose these great men of God had such a struggle accepting a doctrine that says that some people do not have the capacity to be saved? A great answer, I believe, is this position of some. Not having the capacity to be saved is so contrary to so much of Scripture. We will not go into the entire list, but you can begin with John 3.16. Secondly, as many of you already know, such a belief is contrary to the very nature of a loving God as portrayed throughout Scripture. I realize that some of you are still not convinced and are carefully weighing all the evidence of this study. I myself struggled with this very issue for a long time. 
I was a Calvinist for more than 11 years. My beliefs during those years were very much aligned with John Piper, R.C. Sproul, Jonathan Edwards, and many more. But now I concur with Jonathan Edwards' first opinion concerning the interpretation of Scripture, which upholds that only some people have the capacity to be saved, is a horrible doctrine. Some of you might be thinking that there is no doubt that Paul wrote Romans in a two-part fashion. But the next question is, how does Paul's other writings affirm that finding? I'm so glad that you asked because that is exactly the question that's before us in this session. Recall, as we stated earlier, we began this session with the score 101 to none, affirming the two-part Romans position. 101 to none is evidence that is at the highest level of proof, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, for even more proof, we are about to weigh the evidence from other writings of Paul to help you determine if we interpreted Romans correctly. We have to weigh in all of Scripture to make sure that we are contextually and biblically handling it correctly. If we were in a courtroom, this would be called corroborating evidence. By definition, corroborating evidence is evidence that adds to or strengthens the primary evidence. As referred to our other sessions, we continue to use Dr. Gordon Fee's textbook entitled Exegesis. On page 149 of his third edition, Dr. Fee instructs us to analyze the passages that are related to the rest of Scripture. If you go to section 5.1, Dr. Fee poses the question, how does it fit in the overall structure of the biblical revelation? For good Bereans, in searching the Scriptures, this is an obvious question that we should be used to to help us validate any major doctrine. How does it fit with other Scripture? Since we continue to weigh the evidence, we will use a list of distinctions that we found in Romans that I will use to measure Paul's other writings to see if they match up or align with our findings in Romans. How do these distinctions I listed fit or match up with Paul's other writings is the preeminent question for this session. Does Paul's other writings agree? And so we'll be looking at three of Paul's other letters, which he wrote about the same time as he did the book of Romans. If we were to find one instance of alignment, you might respond, well, that's very interesting. But say if we found evidence in two of the letters written about the same time which align with what we have found in Romans, you may say, well, that is pretty convincing. But what if we found alignment in three of Paul's letters, all written about the same time? Would that not represent proof beyond a reasonable doubt? I think many of you would say, well, Jason, that would be amazing. Well, brothers and sisters, prepare to be amazed. First, let's look at a list of the chronological order of Paul's letters. And note that those listed in bold were written within the same three or four year time period. Galatians 49 to 50 AD. 1 Thessalonians 51 AD. 2 Thessalonians 51 to 52 AD. 1 Corinthians 55 AD. 2 Corinthians 55 to 56 AD. Romans 56 AD. Ephesians 60 to 62 AD. Colossians 60 to 62 AD. Philippians 60 to 62 AD. Philemon 60 to 62 AD. 1 Timothy 62 to 64 AD. Titus 62 to 64 AD and 2 Timothy 66 to 67 AD. Now this particular list is from John MacArthur's website, Grace to You. And while most lists vary by a year or so, this is generally what is the, in alignment and agreement with the chronological order as presented on the list. This order is important. And note that the first and second letter to the Corinthians was written in the same year, and that Colossians and Ephesians were two other letters written closest to the time Paul wrote Romans. So let's look closely at the greetings in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sothenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth. Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Wow, do you see the all important with all? Look at all nine translations of this verse with me. Yes, the with all or together with is in each of our translations. Is this not amazing? Paul is obviously delineating between two groups of believers as he greets those in the church at Corinth. In our English language, the with is a preposition with the object in this phrase being all. In the Greek, those words are soon which according to Strong's concordance means with or together with. The obvious point is this aligns perfectly with our finding that Paul addressed two distinct groups within the church in Rome. Here in 1 Corinthians, Paul defined the first group as those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, and yes, this is in the majority of translations. As we noted in our earlier sessions, Paul defines saints in Romans as Jewish. Paul maintains this distinction in his greetings. In this letter of 1 Corinthians, this is exactly as Paul delineated or differentiated in Romans. This is our first point of evidence that the saints in 1 Corinthians 1-2 aligns with saints as separate from Gentiles in Romans. Thus, this is our first point of corroborating or supportive evidence that affirms two-part Romans. Evidence, two-part Romans affirmed. Paul distinguished saints like he did in Romans. Who were the other group delineated by Paul in verse 2? Look closely again with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this aligns with Paul's mystery of the gospel revealed, not concealed. Note that the great difference that I pointed out before, these are not those who were called, these are those who called. This is our second point of evidence affirming two-part Romans. Two-part Romans affirmed the mystery revealed, the gospel is for all who believe. For those who say this is absurd, you must admit that the with and the together with cannot be discarded. These nine translations represent the opinion of hundreds of language scholars. Now let's look at Paul's greeting in Colossians. Could Paul have used similar language in another letter? Read with me in verse 1 and 2 of Colossians. And as a reminder, we're using the Legacy Standard Bible Translation. Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ, in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Do you see the and? Of course you do. The and is astounding evidence that Paul delineated two different groups with the conjunction and. Paul wrote to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ. Paul addresses the church in Colossae as two different groups. Now, some of you are already saying, no, no, that's not correct. But let's first look at all nine translations. Eight of our nine translations uphold the conjunction that the word chi in Greek does exist. And we see that only two of the translations remove the word chi and define saints as faithful brothers. The majority of the translations uphold that the Greek conjunction chi does exist. Some of you might say, well, if Paul did distinguish here, Paul did not realize what he was saying. Well, I mean, that thought would be humorous for one to even think that Paul did not realize what he was saying. Paul knew exactly what he was saying. The evidence aligns that Paul very likely did distinguish between the saints and the other faithful believers. So now this is our third point of proof of evidence. Two-part Romans affirmed and that Paul likely distinguished saints like he did in Romans. Someone might be thinking, Jason, you were just lucky to find three points which may affirm two-part Romans. Okay, all right. Let's investigate that more, shall we? Let's look at the greetings in another letter of Paul. Let's look closely at Paul's greeting in the letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians is another letter that Paul wrote in the time frame of two to four years of Paul's writing the letter of Romans. Read with me in verses one and two. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see this? Paul was consistent. Again, Paul used a conjunction between his greeting the saints 
and the faithful. Do you see the two words in italics? Italics means that these two words were not in the original Greek. Look in all nine translations. Again, eight of the nine translations uphold the conjunction chi, which is in the original Greek language. I'm not making this up. This is a fact. Paul used the conjunction after greeting saints. The implication is very clear. This conjunction and Paul's expression in the greeting, the faithful, is definitely evidence that Paul did delineate the faithful as one of the two groups. This evidence affirms two-part Romans. This is evidence number four. Paul used the conjunction before faithful believers. Okay, so while we are in Ephesians, let us proceed in the reading of the next few verses to examine if any reference to any of the distinctions of Romans are mentioned here in the letter. Again, any mention of one of these distinctions is corroborating or affirming evidence of two-part Romans. Let's continue. Verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Now, some of you are probably very surprised. Just as in Romans, we concluded that Paul defines the saints as the remnant of Israel. Here in Ephesians, Paul describes us as the chosen ones. Then Paul adds that we would be holy, like as in Romans. The first person pronoun indicates that we and us could be the remnant of Israel. After all, there is no doubt that the Old Testament affirms Israel as a chosen people, a holy nation, people only known by God of all people. We see that in Deuteronomy 7, 8 and Amos 3, 2, for example. Chosen and holy are distinctions found in two-part Romans. So this is evidence number five. Holy and chosen are distinctions of we, which aligns with the evidence found in Romans. Let us proceed looking at verse five. By predestinating us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Predestination and adoption are again the very distinctions Paul used to describe the remnant of Israel, as we documented in Romans. This is evidence number six. Predestination and adoption are distinctions aligned with the evidence that we found in Romans, which pertains to the remnant of Israel. Now for verse six. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he graciously bestowed on us in the beloved. Yes, Paul used the same term beloved as he did four times in Romans. It represented the remnant of Israel originally in Romans. And again, this aligns with the finding of two-part Romans. So this is point of evidence number seven. Two-part Romans affirmed. Beloved is one of the distinctions we found in Romans that Paul used to define the remnant of Israel. We continue with focusing on verses 7 through 10. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions, according to the riches of his grace, which he caused to abound to us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him for an administration of the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth in him. Do you see this? Paul again declares, making known to us the mystery, just as Paul declared the mystery revealed in Romans 16. Yes, the distinctives uphold our evidence of the mystery revealed in Romans. So this is point of proof number eight, that the mystery revealed is another distinctive evidence of Romans. Does the alignment stop here? Let's proceed to find out. Look with me at verse 11 and 12. In him, we also have been made an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, to the end that we who first have hoped in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. No, we are not reading Romans. This is Ephesians. And so here we have predestined 
again, coupled with the same who first have hope, as Paul defined in Romans. You see, Paul used almost identical language that he used in Romans. Yes, again, even the mention of the same terms of distinction associated with the we aligns with the evidence we presented upholding the truth of two-part Romans. And so this is point of evidence number nine. The terms predestined and inheritance and first hope are all distinctions of Israel presented as evidence upholding two-part Romans. The Gentiles were not the first to have found hope in Christ. It was the Jews, and that's supporting evidence that Paul wrote in the same fashion. Let's proceed with verse 13. In him, you also, after listening to the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit, a promise. Did Paul change pronouns, just like he did in the beginning of chapter 9 of Romans? Did you see what happened here? Paul changes pronouns from the we and the us to the you, just like Paul did in Romans chapter 9. And not only that, Paul uses the term also, just as he did in Romans chapter 1. Also means in addition to, just as it did in Romans. The you also were none other than the Gentiles. Yes, this is in perfect alignment with the evidence we presented earlier, that Paul wrote Romans in a two-part fashion. Yes, as we will discuss more, the sealing of the Holy Spirit pertained to believers after the resurrection of Christ. So this is point of proof number 10, that Paul switched pronouns from we and us to the you, Gentiles, just as Paul did in the beginning of Romans chapter 9. But wait, there's more. Could there be more cooperating evidence? Look with me at verse 14 and 15. Who is given as a pledge of our inheritance unto the redemption of God's own possession, the praise of his glory. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. The phrase among you and your love for all the saints in verse 15 aligns perfectly with Paul's language in Romans. As presented in the evidence of Romans chapter 16, here again Paul is describing the faithfulness of Gentiles who believed and their regard for the saints. Paul again refers to the saints as separate from Gentiles. This is evidence number 11. Paul again refers to saints separate from Gentiles. The Gentiles. Now we already have 11 points of corroborating or supporting points of evidence. Paul uses the same language and the same terms and the same distinctions in the first 15 verses of Ephesians as he did in Romans. By the way, verse 3 through 14 is one long sentence. The reality of this corroborating evidence of parallel language is tremendous evidence. Ephesians 1.4 is one of the most quoted verses of the Bible to some to claim that God chose those who would be saved before the foundation of the world. But you see, Paul actually used this language to say that God predestined his foreknown people, Israel, before the foundation of the world to be the first fruits of the gospel. And of course, Paul was speaking or writing this as a Jew. The fact that this is part of a long sentence assures us that Paul is writing this in the context of these points of corroborating evidence presented above. It is such a tragedy for anyone to interpret the scriptures out of context. Let's look again at these distinctions of Romans I listed earlier. Capacity to be saved or cap to be saved, the mystery revealed. The mystery revealed is that the gospel is for all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Before the foundation of the world relates to all of these distinctions. It was Israel as God's foreknown people of all peoples. It was Israel that the scriptures defined as the holy nation, a particular treasure of God. It was the remnant of Israel who represented the chosen, adopted, predestined, beloved, and elect people of God. Paul told us, in Romans 16, that he revealed a mystery. And now look again at Ephesians 1, 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. When Paul wrote us, he meant us as Jews who believed just like himself. This is exactly the same us 
Paul defined in the first eight chapters of Romans. Paul in no way and in no fashion was saying that only some have the capacity to believe. You see, when we find that Paul wrote Romans in a two-part fashion, we find the proper lens to see all of Scripture clearly. We find the proper grid or key to the writings. And some of you might be saying, well, this is just a greeting. Does it really make a difference? Does it really matter? There's not more evidence beyond this point in the letter of Ephesians. Could there be more evidence as the letter of Ephesians continues? Any more distinctions like Romans? Well, let us examine some more evidence. Look with me at another long sentence in chapter 2 of Ephesians in verses 11 through 22. This is where Paul explicitly defines the you, okay? Look with me closer at verse 11 of chapter 2. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh, by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Is this not profound evidence? How can anyone deny that Paul is addressing you, the Gentiles? Then, as you look further at verse 12, Paul further clarifies and says, It was the Gentiles alienated from the citizenship of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, and having no hope before Christ, defining the Gentiles as the you, as a separate group from Israel. This is exactly as Paul wrote in Romans. This evidence is indeed corroborating evidence. So this is point of evidence number 12, that Paul wrote to Gentiles as a separate group of believers. Now let us continue in chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. But now in Christ, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace, who made both groups one and broke down the dividing wall of the partition by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so that in himself he might create the two into one new man, making peace. This is astounding. Who was formerly far off? It was not the Jews. Paul declares two groups have been made one. Paul reminds his readers that Christ broke down the dividing wall of the partition so that he might create the two into one. So who are the two? It is two distinct groups. It is none other than the Jews and the Gentiles, just as Paul delineated in Romans. This is definitely more corroborating evidence that aligns that Paul wrote to two distinct groups in Romans. So this is point of evidence number 13. Paul addressed Gentiles separately like he did in the last eight chapters of Romans. Look with me at verse 16 and 17. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, having in himself put to death the enmity. And he came and preached the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Yes, reconciliation is the key concept. Jesus came to reconcile Jews and Gentiles in one body to God through the cross. Jesus came and preached the good news of peace to two distinct groups, those far away who were the Gentiles and those who were near the Jews. Could Paul have made the distinction of the two groups more clear. Just as in Romans, Paul went to great extents to explain that the Gentiles were far off. Gentiles were different from Jews in their history, in their heritage. This obvious effort of Paul to distinguish Gentiles from Jews is exactly as Paul did in Romans. This is point of evidence number 14. The ones far away and the ones near are Gentiles and Jews, distinguished as Paul did in Romans. Let's go to verse 18. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. 
As we conclude this long sentence, Paul again distinguishes the you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with who? With the saints. Once again, Paul makes it clear. He sees the you as separate from the saints, just as Paul did in the latter eight chapters of Romans. This is our 15th point of corroborating evidence. Two-part Romans affirmed. Paul distinguished the you from the saints as Paul did in the last eight chapters of Romans. Now we already have 15 points of corroborating or supporting evidence that align with the finding that Paul wrote Romans in a two-part fashion. And remember, we have two sessions remaining. As we conclude, please keep in mind that the 15 points of corroborating evidence that we have just discovered are spot on. Paul not only used the same terms, Paul used the same pronoun placement and even the same conjunction placement. This forensic evidence confirms the consistency of Paul and his intent overall, that this evidence is in perfect alignment with our findings in Romans. Paul did indeed maintain his distinction of Jews and Gentiles in the other writings we have just discovered. This is just as he did in Romans. The evidence of this abounds, and there is much more to be presented in our next two sessions. You do not want to miss the next two sessions. In session nine, we will continue to review these distinctions in Paul's other writings. We're not done. We will also look at a few passages in Acts. In the next session, does two-part Romans align with Acts and Paul's other writings? Part B. In the meantime, would you be willing to share this study with your friends and family? This is such an important truth. As I've stated before, this study is based upon the book entitled Two-Part Romans by Brent Lay. And you can own your own copy of that book for less than $10. I have included a link shown below. Continue to join us and prepare to be amazed. May God bless you in your journey and your studies. Go and be good Bereans. The early church read God's word without chapter and verse markings along with no cross references or subject headings and they saw the context of the scriptures more clearly. The Exegetical Observations Workbook available now in both the King James Version and the newly redesigned World English Bible Translation offers an all new presentation of the text of scripture which displays just the text. Just like how the early Christians would have received and read it. Plus, it comes with built-in exegetical questions that are designed to help you dig deeper into God's Word without the theological biases, and it offers a wide margin on both sides for all your notes and your findings. And not only is this a never-before-done Bible resource tool to help you learn God's Word better, it is by far the most affordable Bible resource tool that you can get, with each book of the Bible as low as only $1 per book when you get the complete New Testament set. You can check it out at BeAGoodBerean.com. I also want to announce my partnership with two of the best well-known Bible resources out there right now. 
Number one is Logos Bible Software, which is the most comprehensive Bible tool for studying scripture. And my link below provides an exclusive discount on packages and resources. If you've been waiting for a deal, check it out. Also, I partnered with Dwell, which is the best Bible audio app available. Whether you're on the go or you're just relaxing at home, Dwell lets you listen to the Bible in a whole new way. You can click the link below and try it for free for seven days or get up to 30% off your subscription or lifetime access purchase. I hope you're blessed by the discounts I'm able to provide and may you study to show yourself approved.